CataractCoach.com. From our USF Tampa Eye Institute contest, here are the winners. I'm excited to announce the winners of our contest. So first, let's start with the honorable mention. And there are two honorable mention videos that I thought were really good. And these videos include one video from Sahil Agarwal. And that resident put together a video showing the difference in surgical skill along multiple points through residency training. And he played all three videos simultaneously. And you can see that there really is a big difference or a big improvement with time. And I thought that was a very clever way to monitor your own progress. And I like that video. So that's one honorable mention. The second honorable mention was from Andrew Plummer. And Andrew Plummer did a deep dive into one tiny step of surgery, just the hydro dissection. So wow, what a deep dive for one specific little topic. And there were some important pearls. Even I learned something. And I like that attention to detail of spending so much time getting such in-depth knowledge about such a simple step of surgery or seemingly simple step. So check it out today. These are the two uh, honorable mentions. And then tomorrow we'll have second and third place. And then the day after, our grand prize winner. Let's take a really close look at hydrodissection. The goal of hydrodissection is to free the lens from the capsule so that it can rotate. So the rotation part is the endpoint of a successful hydrodissection. And like most people when you're starting out, my technique was just kind of spray and pray. Uh, even when I got a fluid wave, the lens didn't want to spin. I could send another fluid wave from a different quadrant and still had a lot of trouble uh, and still had a lot of resistance to that spinning. The logical conclusion from that, from sending multiple uh, fluid waves, is that it's not the fluid wave that allows the lens to spin. That's, there's something else that's keeping the lens from spinning that's not dissected by sending a posterior fluid wave. Uh, and so we're going to look at that today and decide what, what is in fact keeping us from spinning. And I think what I'm going to show you is that it's the anterior capsule that really uh, provides a lot of that anti-rotational uh, force vector. Uh, and to highlight that, I'm going to show you an article uh, that was in the European edition of Cataract and Refractive Surgery today. This is basically just some experts uh, talking about their pearls and tips for hydrodissection. Um, and you can find lots of people's opinions about this stuff. But the illustrations here I thought were really good. So this is uh, the contribution from Dr. Gia. And I'm going to zoom in on his uh, illustrations here. So he sends a fluid wave, but then his second step is to depress the anterior nucleus First on the left side here, shown in red, uh, and then again we'll see that he goes across and reaches to the other side and depresses on the, uh, on the right side as well. And what that does is it allows the sequestered fluid from the posterior lens capsule, that posterior fluid wave that you send, to come forward. Uh, and that creates separation from the anterior capsule and allows the lens to spin more freely. So let's see that in action here. We send the fluid wave across, we depress the lens, and you see that little gush of fluid come around the anterior uh, lens capsule on the opposite side, and the lens spins very nicely. A uh, few other tips uh, just to kind of help beginners learn hydrodissection. I like to clear the cannula, so in all of these clips you'll, you'll see me squirt some fluid um, before I go into the eye. And that just makes sure that there's no obstructions, that you've got all the air out, um, and it confirms that the cannula is firmly attached. Uh, a lot of attendings will recommend that you uh, tint up the anterior uh, capsule so that you can send the fluid wave as externally uh, as you can. Uh, and one thing that, that really wasn't taught to me that I just had to find out by trial and error is that if you do that, you can inadvertently depress the posterior uh, nucleus. And what that does is it uh, will prevent the fluid wave from passing. So you want to tint up the anterior capsule without actually pressing down on the nucleus at the same time so that you allow the fluid wave to pass. You can see I also like to use a pushing motion for the first spin rather than a pulling. I find that the chain cannula has more surface area on its distal pushing end rather than the hooked pulling end, uh, and I get more purchase that way. And it's just a very gentle force that kind of puts the capsular adhesions on stretch. Those adhesions release, and then the lens spins very, very easily with minimal uh, force needed. And the last thing is that you'll see that I will depress the lip of the main wound as I squirt fluid, uh, which allows some egress of viscoelastic. What that does is it maintains uh, the chamber equilibrium so you don't build up too much pressure and blow out the posterior capsule. 
So hopefully this video shows that with purposeful and efficient technique, uh, hydrodissection can be a very predictable and repeatable phenomenon. Guess the case order. My name is Sahil Agarwal. I'm a second year resident at Duke, and I wanted to give you a sample of three cases out of my first 60 completed at Duke, and I wanted you to guess the case order. So you can see here in panel two that I uh, made a little bit of an anterior incision using tripan in case three here. Left a little bit of an air bubble in the anterior chamber. That incision's a little bit posterior. Panel one, I started using uh, a marked uh, instrument to help me create that 5, 5.5 millimeter rexus here. You can see I'm starting off the rexus for all of them. Already starting on hydrodissection for panel 2 here. Panel 1 hydrodissection. Used a special cannula for hydrodissection. Panel 3, I'm having a little bit of a hard time here with the hydrodissection, but I think eventually I get it and uh, the lens does come up a little bit. Starting FACO for all three of the cases now. You can see here that I uh, am trying to do a pretty standard divide and conquer technique for panel two and panel three. Uh, panel one, uh, I'm also starting with a divide and conquer, which you'll see I'll do a little bit of uh, chopping as well. Using a Connor instrument for panels one and three, and then a Drysdale instrument for panel two. Um, I've been very fortunate at Duke, we get to try different types of instruments and different techniques for doing the surgery, so it's been a great experience so far. Panel 3, I'm starting to bowl out the lens a little bit. The conge is starting to balloon. There's a little subconge heme that's starting to form as well. But uh, eventually, I'm able to get, get a piece of the lens out, and it makes it a little bit easier from there. See, in uh, panel 1, I did a little bit of chopping there. Uh, now we're uh, going to transition to INA, try to get some of that cortex out in, in all three of the panels now. Um, not a whole lot of uh, residual cortex at panel one. Um, trying to get all of it out here. Panel three, notice that there was a small lens piece. Use the Connor instrument to break it up. Having a little bit hard time with sub-incisional um, pieces here. So um, in panel one and three, I used the, uh, the bimanual approach. In panel two, I, I didn't really feel the need to do it. I was able to get all the cortex out. Preparing to put the lens in, I'm having a hard time in panel three <laughs> finding my wound with all the conge ballooning, but uh, eventually I'm able to get the lens in here for all three cases. I'm making sure that I'm putting the lens in the correct orientation and then doing the final INA. So what was the case order? Panel one was case 59, panel two was case 19, and panel three was case two. Thank you so much.